Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, this lecture is the third in a series of um, oscillation uh, with, within certain environment which has certain viscosity. Um, so viscosity is damping the oscillation. The previous two lectures were dedicated to the cases when um, viscosity is so high that actually there is no oscillation. We are talking about example of uh, a spring and some kind of an object. So it's all in some kind of an environment which has certain viscosity. So whenever we are stretching the object to a certain initial position and let it go, in case viscosity is very high, it will not really oscillate at all. It will just move um, slower and slower back to original position, never actually reaching the original position. It will be exponentially close and clo closer and closer. So these are two previous lectures. And this lecture will be when viscosity is not as high and the object will actually go uh, to the neutral position and further and then back and forth and back and forth back and forth gradually um, diminishing the amplitude so that's what will be in today's lecture now this lecture is part of the course called physics 14 it's presented on unizor.com i suggest you to watch this lecture from this uh, website because it's a course which means there is a menu um, there are certain parts of this course interrelated and within each part there have certain topics again interrelated to each other um, uh, plus every lecture has not only the video part which you might actually find let's say on YouTube um, but also a textual part notes and the notes for the lecture is basically like a textbook so whatever I'm saying right now more or less in the same kind of fashion um, explained in a textual format as a textbook. Um, certain things I'm not really going to talk about, but I will put it in, in the textual part. Like, for instance, uh, complex calculations, I'm not going to do it on the board, but they are presented in the textbook, uh, I mean, in the, in the textual part of this lecture. So I suggest you always to go to the website, and it has parallel lecture and the text related to this lecture. Um, and the website is completely free, there are no advertising, no financial strings attached, you don't even have to sign on if you don't want to. But there are some exams, for instance, uh, which are presented on this website. There is also a prerequisite course called Mass for Teens, and um, Mass is mandatory. Today I'm talking about differential equations and complex functions. It's all presented in the Mass for Teens and whatever else you can use as the source of mass knowledge, but you do need mathematics. Okay, let's get closer to this. Now, again, this is the third lecture in the series, and uh, previous two lectures must actually be uh, uh, familiar with, uh, because I will be much briefer in this lecture about the same topics which I addressed in the previous lecture. So, the movement of the object on this particular, uh, on the spring, if it's within the viscose environment, um, depends on certain factors. Well, obviously it depends on the spring. Spring has coefficient of elasticity, k. Well, it depends on the mass of the object, which is m, and it also depends on viscosity of the environment which is also some kind of a constant C, which actually um, affects um, the movement of the object. There are certain forces which are acting. First of all, there is a force of the spring itself, um, which is equal to minus kx of t, where x of t is displacement from the neutral position minus because if it's positive force 
goes to the negative direction. If displacement is negative, the force goes to the positive direction. So that's why there is a minus here. So K is just coefficient which characterizes this particular spring. Now there is also a viscosity. Viscosity is um, viscosity depends on properties of the uh, environment. It can be water or oil or anything, whatever. And uh, also um, it depends on the speed, and that's a very important characteristic of viscosity. It depends on the speed of the object, and obviously on the shape of the object itself as well. So it depends on the object, how it's basically geometrically structured, and its speed. And um, it's uh, more or less uh, corresponds to proportionality um, between the speed and some kind of a coefficient c, which characterizes the viscosity of the um, of the uh, environment, and also a shape of the object itself. So c is kind of a combined coefficient. Um, now these two forces are acting on the object. So this is um, proportional to displacement, and this is proportional to speed of the object, and both are. Uh, negative because this is negative because displacement can be positive or negative and this negative because it's always against the speed whatever the ve vector of speed is viscosity um, resists this particular movement so and obviously we know that the resulting movement of the object um, obeys the uh, Newton's second law, mass times acceleration, this is the second derivative of the displacement, is equal to sum of the forces. Oops, sorry. And this is a differential equation which we were dealing with in the previous two lectures as well. So this is the main differential equation, so I will rewrite it in this format. And we are interested in solution to this differential equation. We were solving this differential equation in the previous two lectures as well. So how did we solve it? Well, we just made an intelligent guess that if you have a function e to the power of gamma t and use this function as x of t, what happens? First derivative would be gamma e to the power of gamma t. Gamma is some kind of a constant. And second derivative would be derivative of the first derivative, so it's gamma square e to the power of gamma t. And if you will substitute it to this equation, you will get m gamma square e to the power of gamma t plus c gamma e to the power of gamma t plus k e to the power of gamma t equals to zero. Now, e to the power of gamma t never equals to zero, so we can just cancel it out. And we have a quadratic equation for gamma. We can find gamma, and we can find quadratic equation has, generally speaking, two different uh, solutions. And we will have two different functions. x1 of t is equal to e to the gamma 1. And, uh, and, and gamma 2, so two solutions. And two solutions for a linear differential equation are sufficient to come up with the general solution. General solution is a linear combination of two partial solutions. So that's the theory of differential equations. I'm not going to, um, to talk about this, but again, if you have a, this type of differential equation, you need two partial uh, solutions, which you just 
guess or whatever. Doesn't really matter how. In this case, we will find it this way. And then the linear combination of these two partial solutions gives general solution. Now, what are the solutions to this? Well, uh, square uh, a quadratic equation uh, has um, the following solutions: two m minus c plus minus square root c quadrat c square minus four m k. So that's the two solutions to our uh, uh, equation. Now, in the previous two lectures, we were considering two different cases. Uh, one case when this, uh, under this uh, square root, it's called discriminant. Discriminant equals c squared minus 4mk. Discriminant of this quadratic equation is positive. It means we will have two positive solutions, and then since we have two positives, uh, I mean positive and negative, sorry, positive and negative, two real solutions, and since we have two real solutions, we will have two different real functions. And these functions are solutions to our quadratic equation, so their, their linear combination is a general solution. That was our first lecture. Second lecture was when this is equal to zero. Well, that's a problem, because now we have only one solution minus c over 2m and we need some other solution partial solution and we found this partial solution in this case and that was the second lecture now this is the third lecture when this is negative well since it's negative there is no real root of this uh, expression uh, there is only imaginary complex uh, root so now back to mathematics, you need the theory of complex numbers. And by the way, in the textual part of this lecture, I have a reference to corresponding chapter of Mass 14's course. So now we are assuming that this is less than zero. And now, what do we do with this? What kind of oscillations are if basically what it says is c is really small. You remember that in the previous cases we did not really have oscillations when this is positive or even zero. Well, it's positive when c squared is greater than 4mk. So it's greater, so it's big. Elastic, um, the viscosity of the environment is big. Now we are talking about when viscosity is small and since it's small, then our oscillations have less resistance, and we might actually have the case when the object goes to the neutral and over crossing the neutral position to the squeezing of the spring, and then back and forth, back and forth. I mean, there is still resistance, C is not equal to zero, but resistance is not as big as in the previous two cases. So this is basically a characterization of whether we do or we don't have oscillations. And now we expect that oscillations will happen because C is small since this is negative. All right? So now let's see. Now from this time on, it's just pure mathematics. Uh, physics is basically finished. C is small. The uh, viscosity is small. That's why we will have um, some kind of oscillations. But obviously, we expect that these oscillations will be with a reduced, uh, will be with a smaller and smaller amplitude. But let's just get to analytics of this. All right. So let me just transform it a little bit. Minus c over 2m plus minus square root. Um, so 2m goes here. So it's uh, c over 2m square minus 2m, it would be 4m squared, so minus k over m. So what I will do, I will put omega equals square root of k over m minus c over 2m squared. I change, so now it's positive. Since it's positive, I can actually uh, use a square root, 
and I have only arithmetic values, so the positive omega is a positive real number, okay? <coughs> it's convenient. Now, using the omega, I can put this as equal to minus c over 2m plus minus omega i, where i is imaginary unit in the complex numbers. So these are two solutions. They are complex. And that's why our function would be a function which takes complex values, which is not really what we are looking for, because we are looking for real values, right? We are talking about x of t means a displacement. Displacement is a real value, so we need the real thing. So now our first um, problem is how to basically deal with real versus complex um, solutions. So we found the sol two solutions which are complex. So, what do we do now? <coughs> now, for instance, I have a function, let's call it y of t, which is a solution to this particular differential equation. Now, this is a complex function. It means that it has a um, real part, and I complex part. I can always imagine it. I can always represent any complex number as a combination this and this. Now in our case, our complex numbers are e to the power of minus c over 2m plus omega i and e to the power minus c to the power of m minus omega omega i omega i t so the gamma is this omega i t so these functions are not <coughs> are not easily uh, represented in this in this way but it's possible and it's very easy actually I'm <coughs> sorry. Well, first of all, this is um, e to the power minus c over 2m. This is the real part multiplied by e to the power omega i t. Similarly, this is also. And this is real. Now, remember Now, remember the Euler's formula, e to the power i, uh, I put something like a, is equal to cosine of of is better, plus i sine alpha, where alpha is any kind of a real number. This is the Euler's formula, <coughs> and again I present it in the Mass 14 course, in the textual part of this lecture, I have a reference to a specific chapter of the course Mass 14 where this is presented and explained, so I'm just using it as is. Now, using this formula, I can always represent this part, um, I'm sorry, this should be minus, and this part as e to the power uh, omega i t is equal to cosine omega t plus i sine omega t and uh, e to the power minus omega i t is equal to cosine of <coughs> minus omega t 
Now, cosine of negative and uh, uh, angle is exactly the same as cosine of the positive, so I can always put minus t plus i sine of minus omega t. But again, sine of minus is minus sine. That's trigonometry, which I hope you still remember. Okay? So, I can represent each of these two complex solutions as a combination of these two functions. And uh, what happens is I will have the corresponding representation in this format, right? <coughs> and now we have a very interesting part. Look, if this y of t is a solution of our linear differential equation, remember, mx of t plus cx of t plus kx of t equals to zero. If this is a solution and there is a real and imaginary part with this i, then each of these real part and separately imaginary part must be solutions as well. Why? Well, obviously, if you have a plus b i is equal to zero, in the complex number, what it means? It means a is equal to zero and b is equal to zero, right? So whenever we put i, we will have, um, uh, I mean, whenever we will have a real part, we will substitute it and we'll have only real functions here. If we will substitute this, since this is a linear equation, I will always go outside, so the whole thing would be only with i's, which means only with, uh, will be imaginary part. And that's why coefficient at i, which will be m y uh, second derivative plus c y first derivative plus, plus k y, it will be with multiplier i. So it will be this part. So this must be equal to zero and this must be equal to zero which means this is a solution and this is a solution of this <coughs> um, differential equation. So again, if you have a complex function which can be represented in this way and you know that this complex function is a solution, then each one, real part and imaginary part, are solutions as well. So in this case, our real part is in this case so instead of this, I have to put multiply by cosine omega t plus i sine omega t uh, cosine omega t minus i sine omega t. So what's the real part? Real part of this solution is this. And real part of this solution is this, which is the same thing. So I have a real part as one particular um, uh, partial solution. So the partial solution which I'm talking about right now is this one. This is one function x1 of t. Now, the imaginary part is the one which, which has a coefficient i, and it's x2 of t is equal to e to the power minus c over 2m times uh, sine omega t. In this case, it's with a plus sign, in this case, with a minus sign. But it doesn't really matter, because what we are talking about is any linear combination so whether it's a plus or a minus doesn't really matter because when the general solution comes up, we will have any kind of a any kind of a linear combination. X of t would be equal to c1 times x1 of t plus c2 x2 of t. So if this is a solution and this is a solution of this linear equation, then any linear combination of these two solutions will give me general solution. 
So that's why it doesn't really matter whether it's plus or minus, since this is any multiplier. So this is a general solution. x3 is equal to c1 times this, plus c2 times this. Okay. That's encouraging, because it's already in a format which looks like oscillations, sine, cosine, as the time goes, it looks like it's oscillating, right? But I would like to uh, slightly change this particular uh, format, and it would be even better understood that this is a real oscillations. Well, let's talk about this expression. C1 cosine omega t plus C2 uh, sine sine omega t. That's what we have here. The only thing is there is a multiplier e to the power of minus. Oh, by the way, it's supposed to be t here. I always forget this. Okay. Now, um, how can I transform this you know, into something which it, uh, seems to be better uh, understood as oscillations? Very simply, um, let's multiply and divide it by uh, square root of c square, c1 square plus c2 square. Nothing's changed. I multiply it and divide it by this, right? Now, with any two numbers, c1 over square root of c1 plus c2 square, and c2 over, I can find an angle when this is equal to cosine of this angle, and this is equal to sine of this angle. How can I do it? Well. Obviously, it's very simple, because I'll just pay, take a, a point on a unit circle. Now, this and these two are basically, um, well, it's better to have it square root of c1 square plus c2 square. And I will have c1 and c2. So the radius is square root of c1 square plus c2 square, and uh, this point corresponds to c1 and c2 coordinates. Whatever these coordinates are, minus, uh, can be minus or plus, positive or negative, but obviously if this is the quality, then this point belongs to the circle with this radius, right? So I'll just take this angle as an angle as a phi. Then C1 would be cosine and C2 would be sine of this angle. No matter what C1 and C2 are. Because square root of C1 square plus C2 square is always a positive, obviously, number. And uh, uh, both C1 and C2 by absolute value are smaller than this root because it's always its addition to C1 square would be great, would be less than C1 square plus C2 square. Same thing here. So they're always somewhere inside this uh, uh, circle. So I can always find a point. For instance, C1 is negative, then it will be this. And the point will be here. So whatever it is, I can always find an angle which has these particular qualities. And what do I have now? Cos co cosine times cosine plus sine times sine times sine is nothing but cosine of omega t minus phi. If you remember trigonometry, that's the function for a cosine of um, difference between two angles. So this is a multiplier. So what do I have as a result? As a result, I have my general solution.
written in a different format. I put some multiplier d, which is actually square root of c square plus c2 square times, uh, no, one more, times e to the power of minus ct over 2m and times cosine of omega t minus phi. So now we see basically the character of this movement. As the t goes, it's basically a sinusoidal kind of uh, oscillations around the neutral point zero. Mm -hmm. But now we are multiplying also on something which is uh, a, a, a negative um, exponent, and as the t goes to infinity, this exponent goes to zero, right? So it's a, we have to basically multiply two graphs. One graph is a cosine, and another graph is exponentially going down. So what happens as a continue as, as a multiplication? Well, if we will multiply, it would be something like this. So the amplitude goes smaller and smaller because we are multiplying something which is between between minus one and one. We are always multiplying by something which is infinite, infinitesimally small. As the t goes by, our oscillations exist, and that's very important because in the previous two lectures, when the discriminant of that quadratic equation, if you remember, was positive or zero, we did not have oscillations. Now we do but they are diminishing as the time goes by. Well, basically, that's it. Now, d and phi, no matter what they are, will be a solution to our differential equation. So how can I find a concrete values for d and phi? Well, we do have initial conditions. Now, I'm usually condition, uh, using condition like this. This is initial stretch at moment t is equal to zero and initial push of zero, the speed basically, is zero, which means there is no push. So if you will use these, then you can find d and phi. It will be two equations with two variables, d and phi, t is equal to zero in both cases. So first you have to have this, which means at point zero, this e to the power of zero is one. Cosine of uh, zero minus phi would be cosine of phi. So we will have d times cosine of phi is equal to a. That's the first equation. Then we have to have the derivative of this derivative is, so this is x of 0. Now, uh, derivative is mm, d e to the minus ct over 2m times derivative of this, which is minus sine of omega t minus phi times derivative of the inner function plus derivative of this, which is minus c over 2m, e to the power minus ct over 2m, cosine omega t minus phi, and then you substitute 0, and you have to have 0 here. So if you have 0, that means x of 0 is equal to d minus sine um, of minus phi, so it's sine of phi with a plus. Times omega. And this would be minus, uh, this is 1. So it's a g c over 2m cosine of minus phi, same as phi. And this is equal to 0. So this is one equation, and this is the second equation. 
equations are really simple. I have solved it inside the uh, textual part uh, in, in the detail, so you can just take a look at this. So that's technical problem. The most important problem was to create the differential equation, find two complex uh, solutions, from these two complex solutions derive two real solutions, and the combination of these two real solutions, which are this and this, gives you a general solution. And the coefficients, well, this is one format, this is another format. This format is kind of easier to understand because it's really visible that this is oscillations. So the only thing is you have to find these two based on initial conditions, and that's just simple algebra, trigonometry. Well, that's it, basically, and uh, that's it for viscosity. So damping using uh, the friction was considered in two lectures, and damping of the oscillations using the um, viscosity was considered in three lectures. And again, in some cases, when either friction is too big or viscosity is too strong. We do not have oscillations. But under certain conditions we do, and all these conditions were explained in, in these lectures. That's it for today. Thank you very much. I do suggest you to read the textual part of this lecture. There are more, including one example actually, and I, I, I built a graph for that particular example with concrete numbers, A and whatever, C, M, so I just assign certain numbers and I come up with certain concrete results and I graph it. So basically I suggest you to take a look at this. That's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.